Our planet, protected by magnetic fields and various etheric zones, is like a Noah's Ark, carrying abundant varieties of living organisms through the hostile environment of limitless space. Self-contained and isolated, all organisms on our planet are exquisitely intertwined and mutually dependent. Our sphere supports and nourishes us while continuing its timeless journey. If our species is to continue to exist, we have no other choice but to strive for a mutually nurturing relationship with our ark, the planet Earth. Our process of exploiting the resources is disrupting and destroying the subtle and exquisite processes of nature. It is one thing to have a planet in which we all live together in peace, quite another to presume we have a planet large enough to withstand constant conflict and competition. Our past choices have corrupted the atmosphere, polluted the waters, caused us to develop nuclear products for which we have little understanding and even less appreciation of their long-term effects. We strive blindly, ignoring the overwhelming evidence and warnings of our impending collapse. We have a choice between abundance or the specter of a dead planet. As we approach the 21st century, the choices we make now will determine not only the quality of life in the next century, but its very existence. Dakota, he was a large and ample man with a vest made of starch white cloth with red polka dots in it. The polka dots were, were not to be forgotten. After getting through with that, I used to sit next to Woodrow Wilson in the theaters when he attended every Saturday afternoon. We all went to the theater, everyone sat down quietly, and suddenly all the lights went out. And a few minutes later, the lights came back on, and the president and his bodyguard were in the center loge. Those were the things that were happening then, and they keep on happening. Actually, by the time we get to Woodrow Wilson, Lots of troubles were brewing. Many difficulties were in the air. I was living in Washington, D.C., and the leaders of a dozen nations were in and out every week or two, trying to solve the problem that ended in World War I. World War I, so the world was at war. War raging everywhere. Crime increasing. Problems multiplying. And no solutions. All. Oh. I'll bring peace to a troubled world. To meet this, therefore, it seems we have to get at new ideas. And you young people growing up in this new century are the ones who must have these ideas. You must have the courage to live up to them and the integrity to protect them. There has to be change. If there is not change, there is nothing but disaster. We cannot go on as we were. In the 19th century, we had plenty of land. We no longer have it. We had plenty of water. We no longer have it. Little by little, the stamina of the people has been undermined. So to do something about it, we have to start with this new generation coming in. We can share with it some of the wisdom we have gained, but we must watch them put this to work and do the things that we have been unable to do. There are great potential possibilities but if we don't stop thinking of nothing but fun and profit, we're going to be in the same problem we have been in in the world for the last 4,000 years. So if we have things to learn, and we must learn them. Now, when we get down to problems of what to do about these things, how does it all start? Are we going to be able to legislate a, a reformation? Are we going to be able to elect people who are going to clean the mess up and give us back the integrities we have lost? Not very likely. The final solution of the whole problem rests upon personal integrity. There must be more people who honestly want to live in a better world. 
If there are not more people, there will not be a better world. Now, looking over the various possibilities, I came on one that seemed to be rather important, and that is the importance of education in the solution of all these problems. <clears throat> but what do I mean by education? Do I mean the kind of schooling we've been getting now? Well, not exactly. It won't work out. But I mean education as a t teaching basic principles of life. There can be no education without ethics. Unless we believe in right, there is no way of living in a right world. If we do not believe in moralities, we can never live in a moral atmosphere. And unless we can continue to develop virtues, we will drown in our own vices. To make this a part of a school system seems to be very interesting. Now, I go back to Egypt, a very colorful country, for certain principles to discuss. In Egypt, the Egyptian was not born a citizen. This is interesting. When you came into the world, you were an, I an Egyptian, but you were not a citizen of Egypt. You might have been born on the steps of the pyramid, but you were still not a citizen. This was because it was deemed that citizenship, mature participation in the labors of the state, required dedication, enlightenment, consecration, and if necessary, self-sacrifice. Now, children in Egypt, up to around 15, 16 years old, wore a child lock of hair. It kind of hung down over the left eye and down onto the shoulder. A thin lock of hair. And this was called the child lock. And as long as that lock would not be blamed for mistakes that he did not know better than to make. But there came a ceremony finally. And in the presence of lawn and the sick, forever charitable. And at this point, was introduced the great negative confession of the Book of the Dead. When the Egyptian died and went into the other world, he, they believed in Egypt that he had to answer to the gods of the underworld for his reputation on earth. He had to be able to give a statement of the, that he had kept the 600 both sides and prove that in every way he was trustworthy, honorable, honest, enlightened, and kind. After he had taken up, became an Egyptian citizen, having the privileges and rights of a citizen. But without this bond, it could not happen. So let's move this forward into another type of world and see what we have here now. Supposing we had, not here, a citizenship by birth, but a citizenship by dedication. Supposing instead of being born an American. We went to school, uh, the lower grades, middle school, and finally graduated from high school. At the time of high school graduation, then citizenship would be a matter of consideration. When the American boy or girl decides to go in for a life of government or statesman's craft, they should not be out merely to get money. They should be reasonable wages, proper salary, proper things necessary, but everything should be pointed to the fact that the citizen is a servant of the needs of the people. Now, if we began producing, we would supply them not only with opportunity, but with excellent recomp uh, recompense and everything that was necessary. They could have a brilliant and lasting career and be honored in the, in the files and records of the nation and expect it to work. In the last 50 years, we have seen several noble experiments in atheism. They've all turned out to be miserable failures. The Napoleon summed it up very well when he said, an, an atheist can win a battle, but only a believer in God can run a nation. And uh, this is very largely the problem we have. There are no basic ideals that are held in common. This does not mean that we have to become theologic, theologically minded, but we have to have some beliefs and value. 
We have to believe in something beyond and above the almighty dollar. If we do not have a belief above the dollar, we will soon erode away the dollar with everything else. In this particular problem, we need people who have a solid belief that the human being is a creature intended for a purpose, that we are not merely something too new and too noble to be put in the zoo. We are a creation with mind, with resources, with ideals, with dreams. We have created great art and great music, but we have also created monumental crime. We have all the uh, wisdom of the past, and all we can do with it is create nuclear weapons. We've got to get a different attitude toward life. We should believe in the ultimate triumph of right. We should re continue to believe that mercy is stronger than hate. We should come to know that we will never have an enduring civilization until we can build it on peace and not on war. We need gradual reformation, not by law on the outside, but by the principles of integrity on the inside. There are in this world now probably something better than three and a half billion people who believe in some form of religious principles. These people, we, we must recognize. We must not view every, everyone who differs from us as being wrong. We must view the individual who has no ideals as the one who is wrong. We must recognize the importance of having principles and standing with them, if necessary, suffering for them. And in most of the nations which have been dominated by completely economic policies, idealism is coming back. Again, the churches are being opened because the country cannot exist without them. But the churches are symbolical. The church opening is our own opening. It is the individual opening his heart and mind to a solutional program better and deeper and more enduring than anything that he can get from the outside. He must learn to depend upon integrities. He must recognize that the universe is governed by law. Even the scientists will tell him that. And laws are very definite. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. For centuries we have been sowing a hurricane, and we are reaping a hurricane. The time is coming when he cannot continue to do these things. We must begin to think in terms of solution. These problems will not go away. We cannot brush them under the edge of the rug. Every morning the, the paper t or the television set tells us of another country involved in hopeless confusion. And we try to meet this great challenge of civilization by building more nuclear weapons. These nuclear weapons cannot save us. The only thing they can do is so completely destroy us that we may not even remember that we ever lived. We've got to do something to make this new century important. And these young people must unite in a pattern of personal integrities. They must recognize that the future of the nation and to a large measure the entire future of the world depends on young people waking up, standing up, and doing that which is necessary. We think of the patriot who goes out and gets himself shot in Vietnam. We are interested now in the patriot who goes out. If the parent isn't reacting constructively in some way, then the child may have to lead the parent. But it is definite that the only way that we can make the next century worth living in is to begin now with the young people who are going to make up its citizenry and getting them ready for the job. And the only way we can get them ready is to get them to get themselves ready. The idea that there's someone standing over us with a stick or a bomb or something is foolish. All of the great gains of history have been made peacefully and kindly by strong, simple people who believed in the truth and lived it. Now, we need a generation of those coming up now. And I think we've got them. I think they're coming from tremendously. The first thing that is helping us 
is the example of the 19th and 20s. From 1900 to 1999, we have a, a practically solid picture of, of trouble. We can turn these young people in any direction and show them the inevitable consequence of doing it wrong. We can also see how, as they go along, they are forcing their own children and their children's children into ways of misery and death simply because we insist on remaining selfish, self-centered creatures with no thought for anybody but ourselves. Young people, did, they did everything that was necessary. And uh, the League was political also. What we call the sachem in and these sea people were wandering around in bear skin and, and beadwork and a few feathers. Then, the second time, the, one of the sachems said he wanted to talk. All right, the brother has the floor. And it must be remembered that when he has the floor, he must not accuse anyone of anything, disparage anyone of anything, but present such facts as he regards necessary to be corrected as facts. And they would plan out what they were going to do. And then one of them said, I want to go across the country to a tribe on the other side. And I must have a protection against wild Indians in between. Satan so said, that is possible. So they gave him the belt, a wampum belt of beadworks and shell. And this wampum belt was the peace belt of the Iroquois League. And with that, an Indian from any tribe could travel anywhere in the United States area with perfect safety. No one would consider doing him any harm. And as a special reward for his wonderful work with the Indians, they gave William Penn a peace belt so that he could go anywhere. And the peace belt had a red man and a white man shaking hands as a symbol of eternal peace. This was so good. You know, the Indians loved Penn. You don't really know how much they loved him. But they had great troubles because they didn't know how to, what to do with him when he died. He wasn't an Indian. He couldn't go to an Indian heaven. And yet, they, they had to take care of him. He would be good to all of them. They had to make sure that he had the best of everything in the afterlife. So they worked it all out. They built a little cabin right at the entrance of the Indian paradise, where he could sit on a chair and watch his Indian brothers go in and out, and they all call out and visit with him, and, and knew him, would know him and remember him forever. Now these are foolish, stupid children's ideas, perhaps, but they are greater than war, and more wonderful than crime, and certainly a greater blessing to humanity than cupidity and decay. Everywhere we're going to have to dream some good dreams, create some new circumstances because they're necessary, be kinder, be wiser, and, to, and in every way that we can, remember the great problems that we all face together. This world is, is shrinking. Our natural resources are becoming fewer. Every effort is being made uh, to b tie up, bind up, and exploit our remaining natural resources. This is a great mistake. So we'd like to see young people starting out in this new generation a little different than the one we've just seen. We would like to have them think in terms of planning good lives together. Planning a marriage that's going to stick. Planning children who are going to be loved and treated well. Planning the problems of responsibility to raise and maintain homes under a strenuous economic problem remaining in all things faithful to principles and wise enough to would come. And after the end of the 20th century, the paraclete would come. And that was the great teacher. After the violence, there would come a beautiful and noble being, a wonderful leader, a great soul, who would bring together the peoples of the earth into the brotherhood of mankind under the tender governing of the fatherhood, motherhood of God, so that the old prophets of old prophesied the importance of this 21st century. And as it comes nearer and nearer, you, these children of today will be in their early 20s 
when this century comes. They will be right at the age when they want to start doing things, building things. They want to be honest. They want to be true. They want to have an opportunity to do what is right. We must do all we can to prepare them by giving them a proper education. And then we must do all we can to support them by staying free, really, is to be free of the over-influence of other people. And we are over-influenced because we do not know injuries. So we'd like all these young people to think as much as they can of being of a new generation and a new world rising up from the years and centuries to come, the foundations of a nation and a world that can endure in peace among the histories of mankind. We'll have the opportunity to fulfill their destiny.